Well, hello everyone, and thank you for joining us for another edition of our Navy League Learns webinar series. Today, we will be focusing on the Jones Act. I'd like to introduce our moderator for today's events, Navy League National Vice President of Legislative Affairs, Mr. John Kaskin, a position that he's held for three and a half years. Mr. Kaskin has served as the Maritime Senior Advisor in the Office of the Deputy Undersecretary of Navy for policy plans, oversight, and integration. He worked for 25 years in the OBNAB Division Director, responsible for developing requirements and funding for Navy League logistics ships, maritime prepositioning, and strategic sea lift ships. We're fortunate to have Mr. Kaskin as a member, a senior member of the Navy League of the United States. And Mr. Kaskin, I will now turn it over to you, sir. Well, thank you very much, Mike. And uh, everybody welcome aboard. Uh, for our uh, our Jones Act seminar. Uh, this year, uh, Section 27 of the Merchant Act of 1920, or the Jones Act, celebrates its 100th anniversary. This law, named in honor of uh, Senator Wesley Jones of the state of Washington, is a cabotage of the United States that, that uh, requires the movement of cargo between two points in the United States mainland, Alaska, Hawaii and Puerto Rico uh, to be on ships that are owned by U.S. citizens uh, with at least 75% ownership uh, by at least 75% crewed by U.S. citizens built or rebuilt in the United States and registered in the United States. The Jones Act is the continuation of laws that encourage U.S. flag uh, and allied industries. Uh, the, it, and it dates back to our first Congress, which provided decreased tariffs for U.S. flag and U.S. built ships to encourage uh, those industries. Cabotage laws of various types are widespread and exist in nearly two-thirds of the United Nations maritime the nations, and which amount to 91 countries and representing over 80 percent of uh, the world's coastline. While fewer number of countries require ships and domestic trades to be built uh, domestically, unfair direct and direct government support by China and South Korea has resulted in countries without such protections losing their shipbuilding industry. Since they only two countries build, those two countries, China and uh, Korea, build over 70% of the worldwide market share and it's growing in terms of gross registered tonnage. The Navy League uh, last month uh, released a report uh, titled China's Maritime Ambitions Make the Case for the Jones Act and a Strong Maritime uh, Industry. Uh, copy here. There was a link to, to it uh, uh, when you registered and it's on the Navy League website. It gives you a lot more detail uh, on what we're talking about today. It highlights uh, why our cabotage law, the Jones Act, is even more necessary to be maintained today and while we are facing our first real maritime peer competitor uh, since World War II. Nevertheless, uh, during this 100th uh, anniversary year, the Jones Act has been under continued, uh, continual attack, especially by some think tanks and some domestic shippers. They argue that the law and the rationale behind it is outdated and should be repealed. They claim it interferes in the free marketplace, adds cost to domestic goods, and impedes commerce. They don't buy the arguments that it provides economic and national security. Our panelists today will make cases that refute those uh, arguments that the Jones Act, by bolstering our merchant marine and shipbuilding industrial base, does provide economic, homeland, and national security. They will demonstrate that the public good it provides outweighs any real or theoretical negative impacts. Now, before I introduce them, I want to uh, quote something that I recently found by uh, a renowned free market economist that might sh shed some light uh, on these arguments. It's from Adam Smith, uh, an inquiry into the nature and causes of the wealth of nations, which was the, the premier textbook on the free market. And, but it had several a small number of exceptions to the free market economic theory, specifically as it pertains to national defense. I quote, there seem, however, to be two cases in which it will be generally be advantageous to lay some burden upon foreign for the encouragement of the domestic industry. The first is 
when some particular sort of industry is necessary for the defense uh, of the country. The defense of Great Britain, for example, depends very much upon the number of its sailors and shipping. The act of navigation therefore very properly endeavors to give the sailors and shipping of Great Britain the monopoly of trade of their own country, in some cases by absolute prohibitions and in others by heavy burdens upon shipping of foreign countries. As defense, however, is much more important than opulence, the act of navigation is perhaps the wisest of all commercial regulations, unquote. So it gives you uh, another perspective of why such laws exist. Now I will uh, proceed to uh, uh, giving a, pre a the biography, a biography of uh, Congressman Istook. So if he would uh, turn on his video. I'm here. Okay, so uh, a short bio here. Uh, Ernest Istook served 14 years as a congressman and says he's now in recovery. As a member of the subcommittee uh, and chairman, uh, subcommittee chairman of the House Appropriations Committee, he worked and oversaw issues including the Defense Department and intelligence agencies, uh, all forms of transportation, including maritime, the Customs Service, and many others. He also was an original member of the Homeland Security Committee. Since Congress, he's been a fellow of the Heritage Foundation and at Harvard's Institute of Politics and has taught political science at universities, created and chairs a nonprofit called the Americans for Less Regulation and is currently a fellow with the Frontiers of Freedom Foundation for which he writes about the Jones Act uh, and China's aggressive efforts to dominate commercial shipping as well as to gain military control of the seas. He also writes on multiple other issues, plus he has an active law practice as a trial attorney. So, Congressman, it's uh, yours. Okay, Th thank you, John, I appreciate that. I'm, I'm grateful for the time that uh, many people are spending uh, to join this teleconference. As John was mentioning, uh, the big challenge is to help people to understand that the Jones Act is not just an economic measure. It is a measure of national security. A lot of people have not seen the connection between trade, in particular uh, maritime trade, and national security. And that's what my presentation is going to focus upon, especially with the illustration of what is going on in China. Uh, could I have the uh, slides begin, please? This is uh, an overview of uh, what I'm going to be talking with you. You see headlines, although most of the mainstream media don't pick up on it. China's seaport shopping spree. China is building about 1,200 ocean-going merchant ships a year. The United States is building eight. We have the annual report that came out this summer from the Department of Defense talking about how these are aspects of China's One Belt, One Road program, which, to quote the DOD report, is leveraging civilian construction for military purposes and logistics for military purposes. A lot of people don't really appreciate the significance of logistics, but it's there. And uh, another report from this summer talking about the state support for China's global trade maritime issues is unrivaled in size and scope. They're building a third of the world's vessels, producing 96% of the shipping containers. They have the largest port and logistics company in the world, and it is the maritime supply arm of the People's Republican Army, or People's Liberation Army, I should say. Let's go to the next slide. Uh, this is an article that was published in the National Interest this summer. The really boring way China would try to win a war against America. Uh, kill the logistics. You control logistics and you control things. Let's go to the next slide. This is from that article in National Interest, which was uh, authored by Peter Suchik. The People's Liber, this is a quotation. The People's Liberation Army Navy plan understands the need for ports around the world. Just as the British Empire's Royal Navy understood the need two centuries ago. China cannot truly be a global superpower without such ports, which could enable their Navy to operate great distances away. 
So that's why they made their first overseas military base in Djibouti, the African nation on the Red Sea. The One Belt, One Road Global Infrastructure Program has logistics and military context. It calls for a string of facilities that could be used for dual purposes, military and civil. Next slide uh, has a, a, a quotation from a retired Admiral Gary Roughhead. We, know, we neglect logistics, and logistics is how this country has won wars. That was his testimony to Congress this summer. And as he said, a Chinese admiral made it very clear to me that our logistics ships were a primary target, because if he can take out logistics, he takes out the lifeblood of the fighting ships. Next slide. Remember when this was the big thing, FedEx, logistics are coming to the forefront of public awareness. FedEx says, when it absolutely positively has to be there overnight. Well, we learned that delivery matters. Next. Then we've seen the power of controlling both the sale of goods and the delivery of goods. Amazon has taught us that lesson. Let's go to the next one. Now, when we look at the scale of what China is doing, this was put together by an Australian think tank comparing the Chinese Belt and Road Initiative, which began back in 2013 officially, with the Marshall Plan to rebuild Europe after World War II. And you'll see the numbers down there. In um, today's dollars, the Marshall Plan was spending about $13 billion. In today's dollars, China's Belt and Road Initiative involves about 1.3 trillion. It's 10 times bigger than the Marshall Plan ever was. That's the scale of what we're dealing with. Let's go next. Now, China people have been aware for a long time, oh yeah, things are made in China. And that's why people say we can save money if we buy in China. Of course, then people began to realize that it was hollowing out America's industrial core. Uh, the Rust Belt was getting rusty from that. Made in China, yeah, China sell things but they're not satisfied with being the big salesman. Like Amazon, they want to corner the delivery market as well. Let's go to the next. The trick to understanding the significance of what China is doing is to realize that 90%, 90% of world trade goes by ship. And it's been recognized since the ancient times of uh, uh, Themistocles of Athens, for example, he who controls the sea controls everything. That's China's plan in a nutshell. Let's go to the next one. These are some of the things that I highlighted on the opening slide, some of the studies that have been coming out but not getting the media attention which they deserve, not getting the level of public awareness that they deserve. And even look at uh, down at National Review's clipping how China weaponized the global supply chain, how to beat China's military civil fusion, because it's not just a matter of Chinese merchants or the Chinese military, it's how they work together. If we look at the next slide, this was this summer's compilation by the Defense Department of major Chinese companies with links to the Chinese military, which are operating at significant levels within the United States. The fusion of the civilian and the military in everything that is being done by China's companies in world trade. Next slide. I'm sure most of you uh, with your familiarity with maritime are familiar with the major global shipping routes illustrated on uh, this particular map. Uh, we see the uh, big crossings on the Atlantic and Pacific. Uh, a lot of people don't realize just how significant the Indian Ocean is for trade. And look just to the east of China's coastline, how busy that is. Let's go next. Now compare that, and this goes back to that Belt and Road Initiative. China is acquiring control of major ports worldwide and at choke points. Uh, these are some of the places where they've acquired major stakes and controlling stakes in major ports. Uh, I'm gonna give you some illustrations of that in a minute. 
about the only place where they've been pushed out once they got in was when the Trump administration forced China to divest itself of about a $2 billion interest they had in, at the uh, port of Long Beach, California, which they were required to do divestiture. Let's look next. Now, I'm just giving you an overview, but there's lots of detail out there about China's seaport shopping spree. Remember, we're talking about China controlling not only the making of goods, but the logistics, the delivery of them, which means you can also cut off the ability of competitors to deliver things. So buying, uh, building the ships, buying up the ports, controlling the logistics. Uh, Forbes magazine wrote about China's seaport shopping spree, talking about ports all over the world being bought up. Uh, NPR, over a dozen places in Europe now have Chinese firms with large stakes in controlling their ports. By the way, that includes the ports at the north end of the Suez Canal, as well as down in Djibouti at the southern end. Um, the um, foreign policy writing up, why is China buying up Europe's ports? And then down in the Indian Ocean, how China got Sri Lanka to cough up a port, basically loaning billions of dollars to build a port they can't pay and you repossess. They, that, that also with the uh, Gwandar port in Pakistan. The next slide is just giving an illustration of the scope of this Belt and Road Initiative. It's in over 150 countries that they have bought in, buying their way in with this over trillion dollar effort of the Belt and Road Initiative. Next, the world's busiest ports are dominated by Chinese ports. And if we go to the next slide, again, the top 50 container ports, again, Chinese domination, 40%. And uh, the rest of the world is the remainder. The largest area besides China is Europe with 14%, China 40% of container ports. Next, the uh, construction of ocean going merchant ships, whether they be container ships, roll on, uh, roll on roll offs or whatever. China is building about 1200 a year. The United States is building eight. This is because of those massive multi-billion dollar subsidies from China. Next slide, uh, Financial Times reporting China, Beijing spending billions to expand its port network, to secure sea lanes, and of course, to build the ships. And next, the thing about the Jones Act is the some 40,000 vessels that ply the domestic waters, the rivers, the intercoastal canals, and so forth in the United States, because of the Jones Act, despite China's effort to make inroads every place else, because of the Jones Act, they cannot expand in the all important domestic trade waters of the US because of the prohibition of the Jones Act. Final slide. I, uh, no, it's not up there. If you go back one, it may be there. Anyway, um, there's a, a full paper I've written for the Frontiers of Freedom Foundation on how the Jones Act blocks China's plan for global domination. It's on their website, ff.org. And anybody would like to communicate with me, here's my email address, ejistook, e-j-i-s-t-o-o-k, at gmail.com. The Jones Act is not just about economic issues. It's about national security, and it's an important bulwark against China's plan to control the world by controlling shipping. Thank you. I look forward to the discussion later. Well, thank you very much, Congressman. That was a very powerful initial presentation that should get people thinking about uh, the title of our report uh, that came out uh, last month. Now I'd like to introduce uh, Admiral uh, Zukunft's uh, bio. Uh, Admiral Paul Zunkunf, uh retired, uh, served as the 25th Commandant of the United States Coast Guard from 2014 through 2018. Prior to his selection as Commandant, he served as the Commander of Coast Guard Pacific Area, the operational commander for all U.S. Coast Guard missions uh, within the half of the world, including those uh, that are claimed by China. 
He also served as the federal on-scene coordinator for the Deepwater Horizon disaster, the largest maritime oil spill in U.S. history, where he directed over 47,000 first responders, a flotilla of more than 6,700 vessels, and over 120 aircraft. As Commandant, he obtained the, for the Coast Guard its highest appropriation in the history to modernize its fleet and upgrade its aging infrastructure, while concurrently attaining four clean financial audit opinions, the only one, uh, only service in the Department of uh, Armed Service to do so. His 41 years of active duty service in eight commands to include three Coast Guard cutters spanned the globe, and the service has emerged as the gold standard for promoting maritime safety and security. The Admiral is now living in Hawaii and utilizing his expansive knowledge and experience as a global maritime affairs consultant and currently serves on the Climate and Security Advisory Board at the Wilson Center. And he's a board member of the, uh, of the, uh, of the Honolulu Council of the Navy League, which I'm sure is his most important position. So uh, thank you very much, uh, Admiral, for uh, joining us uh, today. Hey, John, yeah, thank you, and uh, thank everyone for joining us on this webinar, and I thought the congressman did a very good uh, bookend approach of what is really at stake when we talk about the Jones Act, uh, but I think we really need to go back to the beginning, you know, and it was at the conclusion of World War I where we didn't have the adequate sea lift as a seafaring nation to support our war effort in, in Europe. Um, and, and that was really the impetus for the emergence of the Jones Act. Um, and then fast forward to World War II, and we had over 1,500 merchant ships uh, that were sunk before they arrived in theater. Back to that very point that the Congress had made is that it's all about logistics. Uh, and if you've seen the movie Greyhound, uh, you know, it really drives that point home as well. And so then where are we today? You know, our ready reserve fleet is aging. Um, as a seafaring nation, uh, we have fewer seafarers because we have fewer ships, uh, which is a perishing skill set when you look at it. If, if in a time of need, you need to activate these safe seafarers, we saw in Desert Shield, uh, trying to get foreign carriers to move our commodities to support a war effort in high risk waters. Some of them refused to do so. Um, so to depend on a foreign carrier and then foreign seafarers to carry out our bidding in an overseas campaign is probably a flawed assumption. And for me, the greatest flawed assumption is that if we do have to mobilize, that every one of those ships, and there are not nearly enough of them, will arrive at their point of debarkation unmolested. Uh, and if we look at history, if we look at the proliferation of diesel subs, not just with China, but among potential other peer competitors, it's a flawed assumption going forward. Now, if you step back a minute, and if you look at the world, just geography, uh, any nation would have geographic envy when they look at the United States. We have rivers that run east, west, north, south, that connect to deep water ports that connect to the global commerce. So it's often lost upon us when we look at that whole inland river lattice work of seafarers as well, moving those commodities. And some of these are anhydrous ammonia, LNG, uh, very volatile commodities that are being shipped through metropolitan riverside fronts. Uh, would we be comfortable having a, let's say, for example, a foreign crew, perhaps a Chinese crew, moving those commodities at a point in time where we have global tension with a rising China? Uh, and then we have little to no leverage in terms of our ability to influence behavior. Uh, dredging and salvaging that takes place in our seaports, uh, particularly in our military essential seaports. Uh, that is also covered by the Jones Act. Uh, we would lose that capability as well. And so what do we see with China? Uh, I call it, and it's been called by economists as a, what, a debt trap diplomacy. Uh, you heard about Djibouti, uh, and that was originally destined to be a commercial seaport. Well, today it's a military seaport as well. And when Djibouti was unable to make payment on its loan to China, then China takes it over. Uh, Greece, Piraeus, 
um, right now is predominantly controlled by China. They made a $5 billion investment to a cash-strapped Greece at the time, and they came to their rescue. But this is a long game that we see playing out among us. Uh, we're also at an inflection point where the United States has the ability to export oil and LNG. Now we can certainly do that on US flag carriers because at the same time, we are very dependent on foreign flags to deliver oil to fuel our military capability. And this would be an investment going forward as we look at our ability to export US commodities in the global market on US carriers. It does a couple of things. One, it invests in our shipyards. Uh, during World War II, every two days, three Liberty ships were being launched from multiple shipyards across the United States. Today, we have roughly five Jones Act seaports, which is why we're only delivering eight ships on an annualized basis. But I've spent time at these shipyards, and many of them are third, fourth generation shipyard workers. Hard work, well-paying jobs, and a very tangible commodity that they deliver because at the end of the day, it supports our economic and yes, our national security as well. But as we start shrinking that industrial base, we become even more dependent on foreign shipyards to do our bidding. And in a time of a crisis or with global tensions, uh, that probably assumption is not a good one to make, but it's, a, it's an investment that is off, often lost upon our industrial capacity where it was and unfortunately where it stands today. And then finally, I'd just like to close with this thought. And we've been what I would call dead reckoning. You know, for those of you who have navigated, it means you're, you're sailing in a direction, but you really haven't taken a precise fix over multiple watches. Uh, well, we've been through two watches now administratively uh, without what I would call a coherent national maritime strategy. A national maritime strategy that connects to a national security strategy. And that's where the Jones Act needs to be woven into our national strategy policies, our family of strategies, if you will. Um, but it's time that we take a fix, uh, that, that we redefine our global presence. And with that global presence, our national maritime strategy that needs to be folded in with that as well. And that falls right on the ears of our Navy League. You know, that is Navy, Marine Corps, Coast Guard, and also our merchant marine. Um, all four, four of those need to be intricately linked and not exclusive of one another as we look at a strategic way forward uh, in consideration of the Jones Act and where we see ourselves in the next 20 years as a truly seafaring nation. Um, so with that, I'll kick it back over to you, John. Thank you very much, uh, Admiral, for, uh, for, for such a strategic presentation. And uh, for the people uh, who are watching, uh, we do have a chat room and we'll be taking some questions uh, uh, after uh, the three presentations and I ask one or two questions as well. So our final uh, panelist is uh, uh, Timothy A. Walton. Uh, he's an expert in force development and um, air and missile defense and long range missiles and logistics. Uh, his research and analysis focus on uh, development of new operational concepts and the assessment of trends in the future warfare in the Indo-Pacific security dynamics. Tim is currently a fellow at the Hudson, in Hudson Institute Center for Defense Concepts and Technology. His latest published effort, America's Sea Power at Crossroads, a plan to restore the U.S. Navy's maritime advantage, was co-authored with Brian Clark and Seth Cropsey. Uh, and was input into the uh, um, Battle Force 2045 effort that he'll talk about a bit later. Prior to joining Hudson, Mr. Walton was uh, a research fellow at the Center for Strategic and Budgetary Assessments, uh, where he led and contributed to studies and war games for the U.S. government and allies on new operational concepts and force planning. And two of these studies, which are a direct interest to this audience, are strengthening the U.S. defense maritime industrial base, uh, plan to improve maritime industry industry's contribution to national security. 
Uh, it was co-authored with, again with Brian Clark and Adam Lennon. And Tim was a lead author for uh, a study called Sustaining the, Flight, uh, Sustaining the Fight Resilient Maritime Logistics. Sustaining the Fight, colon, Resilient Maritime Logistics for a New Era, uh, which uh, is a, a very impressive report that talks about uh, how a strategic lift is, will be important to a contingency in the Pacific. Before that, he was a principal uh, at uh, Alios Consulting Group and an associate of Delix Consulting Studies and Analysis. Um, and he served as a guest lecturer at Georgetown University, where he received uh, both a, a BS and master's degree. And okay, and we'll have uh, Tim now uh, give his presentation. Thank you. No, thank you for that generous introduction, John, and thank you all for joining us. It's a pleasure to be on this panel with you, John, and Congressman Istuk and Admiral Zukunft, and thank you all for, for coming. Um, as John mentioned uh, last year and, and earlier this year, uh, my colleagues Brian Clark, Adam Lemon, and I worked on a study called Strengthening the Defense Maritime Industrial Base. Um, we took a sort of blank slate view as part of this study and considered a range of options. Uh, one of those options was eliminating the Jones Act. Um, it's an act that's garnered a fair amount of criticism, and we wanted to critically evaluate whether or not it contributes to national security and could it be eliminated from sort of the portfolio of laws and regulations governing the industry. Um, after lots of analysis and considering various options, uh, we definitely concluded that the Jones Act is vital to U.S. national security and that the Jones Act should be continued and, and should be incorporated as part of our, our force moving forward. Uh, the Jones Act has a number of economic benefits. Um, it employs U.S. citizens and, and permanent residents ashore and afloat and uh, prevents the outsourcing of those jobs to other countries like China. But at the core of the law is truly national security. Uh, and I wanted to focus on five national security benefits uh, before we, we move on into to our discussion period. Uh, the first has to do with strategic sea lift. So uh, Jones Act crews uh, operate normally during peacetime in commerce, right? They contribute to the U.S. economy, but they, if necessary, could contribute during a crisis or a conflict to man a, a number of different U.S. flag ships, both Jones Act ships, ships in international trade, and then U.S. government ships in the Maritime Administration and in the Navy's Military Sea Lift Command for that strategic sea lift mission. Uh, the Maritime Administration estimates that about 29% of the mariners necessary to activate the strategic sea lift fleet would come from the Jones Act crews. And an even greater proportion could then be called upon due to the rotation cycle if necessary to offset some attrition losses. So the Jones Act is absolutely vital to being able to man um, and operate our strategic sea lift fleet. It also contributes to the strategic sea lift fleet in terms of provision of ships, although to a lesser degree, uh, but it has been throughout history a significant element of its contribution. And if we look recently to, or relatively re recently to Operation Iraqi Freedom, the first U.S. flag commercial ship that contributed to the operation was in fact the Jones Act ship. Uh, the second major benefit has to do with its support to U.S. shipyards and the broader supplier base that allows us to field a national security fleet and a broader national fleet. Uh, the U.S. Navy uh, during the competition phase or peacetime primarily relies on a, a few large shipyards to build large combatants, especially nuclear powered ones. Um, these are vital, but they're also complemented by a second category of shipyards. Uh, these other shipyards normally engage in building ships for the US flag commercial fleet, for the Jones Act fleet. Uh, they build these, these ships for the commercial trade during peacetime, but occasionally uh, different government agencies call upon them to build ships. So the Navy occasionally needs auxiliaries of various kinds or smaller ships that it calls upon those. The US Coast Guard also depends on it. The US Army, the National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Agency and others will call upon these other shipyards to support that industry. If the Jones Act were not active, those shipyards would effectively go away. And whenever these government agencies would need that shipbuilding capacity, it wouldn't be resident, which would be a major concern not only during this competition phase or peacetime because we couldn't build the fleet we needed, uh, but it would also be a concern during a conflict if we needed to ramp up ship uh, construction to offset attrition losses or increase demands on the force. Uh, the third significant benefit has to do with the maintenance of our internal waterways. 
Uh, Admiral Zakunf covered this pretty well. And, and I think uh, the ability to ensure that adversaries um, are more challenged in their ability to uh, deposit underwater surveillance equipment, for instance, near naval facilities or uh, opportunities for other forms of sabotage, or is really enabled by the fact that we have a Jones Act US fleet conducting these activities instead of a foreign flag one. Uh, the fourth major benefit has to do with ensuring we can enforce our immigration controls throughout our country, and that primarily supports sort of a homeland security type uh, mission that's pretty important. But the fifth uh, significant benefit, and I think it's a growing one that both Congressman Istook and, and Admiral Zukunft um, were pointing at, has to do with our ability to ensure uh, our commercial and political linkage with non-contiguous states and territories. So the Jones Act ensures that non-contiguous states and some US territories um, have to be, um, commerce between the other points in the US and those locations has to go on US flag, US built ships. And the, the, the fact that those requirements are in order helps ensure that we have a strong commercial linkage between uh, these locations and that adversaries such as China, which has the world's largest merchant marine and largest global network of ports, isn't able to take over those links and during peacetime shape commercial and, and market uh, interactions, but then during a crisis or conflict, deny us the very ability to the very ability to go to other points in U.S. territory uh, for commerce or to support the war effort. Um, that element, I think, will be increasingly important moving forward in the future. Um, as John pointed out, the, the Jones Act isn't new. It's one of the very first. Acts, it was the very first act of Congress in 1789 is the progenitor of the Jones Act today. And the logic that undergirded that act uh, in 1789, in 1920, and now in 2020 still stands. Uh, but that doesn't mean that there isn't, um, but that still doesn't mean that there isn't a need to improve the U.S. maritime industry. Um, and as Admiral Zukunf was pointing to, there are major opportunities that we need to in the coming years tackle to ensure that we can en enhance the economic competitiveness and vibrancy, and also the national security contributions of the U.S. maritime industry. And I'm looking forward to discussing those with you all. Thank you. Over to you, John. All right. Thank you very much, Tim. I appreciate it. And uh, let's uh, bring up uh, the other uh, two panelists. Uh, for a view, and then we can ask and have some questions asked. I've received a couple from the audience, but let me just ask uh, one to you while you're still there. Uh, one of your the resilient logistics study that I stumbled over uh, did show that there was a a, a major uh, uh, requirement for tankers in supporting a Pacific uh, scenario, uh, and we have. Uh, uh, less about a half a dozen of uh, tankers that are in international trade uh how do you see that the the jones act tanker fleet which is amounting to about uh 40 plus uh, product tankers might be able to play in supporting such an operation uh, th th that's a great question john um, as you pointed uh, the u.s transportation command had in 2016 concluded that the u.s has a requirement for 86 strategic sea lift tankers to be able to carry fuel for US operations in a potential contingency. Um, that 86 requirement didn't account for attrition losses, for instance, that, that Admiral Zakunf was hinting at, and could grow. Uh, there's an ongoing new mobility capabilities requirement study that will examine that. But what's clear is whether the number is 86 or more than 100 or some other number, uh, the fact that right now the US Navy would probably have access to around eight or nine uh, U.S. tankers, when we don't include the Jones Act fleet, means that there's this enormous gap, uh, and we need to be able to fill that gap. Uh, the Jones Act tanker fleet provides a critical core of U.S. mariners that could support those missions, but then also U.S. tankers. And, and uh, during a contingency, if we don't have another way to fill that gap, um, I think it's certainly likely that we would call upon those U.S. flag tankers to play a role in, in strategic sea lift of fuel. Uh, moving forward, I, I think the nation needs to develop a more comprehensive approach for addressing these requirements. And there are a few different options. Uh, one is the tanker security fleet proposal uh, that's been advanced in Congress. And perhaps a modified version of that could be pursued to grow the number of U.S. flag tankers in international trade. Uh, a second is increasing the amount of DLA energy preference cargo. So DLA energy currently buys a significant portion of its overseas fuel abroad. 
uh, at closer to these refineries in foreign countries. If we bought some of that fuel from, or a larger portion of that fuel from US refineries and then had that cargo go on US tankers, um, it would provide more preference cargo for those tankers and allow us to grow the number of, of US flag tankers. And then the third would be other forms of preference cargo initiatives. So for instance, by having um, a growing portion of US energy exports go on US flag tankers, both for um, fuel, uh, for crude or LNG. And that could take place sort of on an escalating proportion uh, as it has been uh, advanced by uh, a proposal in Congress today. So um, moving forward, this is an absolutely critical issue that DOD needs to tackle. And it won't get done unless Congress, I think, starts to apply some pressure and take some action in the coming year. Thank you, uh, Tim. I appreciate that answer. Uh, Admiral, during your uh, presentation, you talked about uh, the concerns that we would have about having uh, foreign flag uh, ships, particularly uh, if they were Chinese crews going up and down our railways. Uh, uh, and there has been some questions about what would be the impact other than uh, to, pro to provide the appropriate security against uh, um, the uh, involvement of uh, that trade. Uh, to do. What would the Coast Guard have to do? What would CBD have to do or ICE have to do um, with respect to the cost, manpower, and infrastructure in order to uh, preclude uh, uh, the harm uh, to the nation if uh, the Jones Act had been repealed? Yeah, I guess I might answer that first with a, a sea story, John. And while I was the comment of the Coast Guard, the opportunity to protect the sticks um, of a, a line boat. This is the tug, and we're pushing 60 barges. Um, that would take about 3,000 trucks to carry that very same commodity to the junction of the Ohio River and the Mississippi River, uh, where you've got currents, uh, you've got densely populated areas that we were traversing, uh, and shifting sandbars. So this is an art. Uh, this isn't anyone can drive a line boat. The captain of this ship was nearly my age, which means north of 60, uh, and has been doing that his whole life. And, and it takes years and years to acquire this skill set. To think that you could parachute in a foreign crew um, to do our bidding in, in our inland waterways would be absolutely nothing short of folly. And I think to the point that Tim had made as well, uh, what are they doing during that transit? You know, are, are they are they spreading the seeds of, of cyber germ warfare um, as they make these transit as well? I mean, we really have to think, you know, from an adversarial standpoint, and sometimes we often default to truth. In fact, there's a great book written by uh, Malcolm Gladwell recently came out about talking to strangers. And we have this tendency to default to truth. Well, we need to be very wary of what this long game is of China. It is very opaque, uh, to say the very least. Uh, but going back to Mark Twain, you know, this is no, no occupation for a journeyman. Um, and that's what makes this nation so great. We have these capabilities right here. And I just, you know, with this other point, and I've looked at a number of studies, the cost of moving freight and out here in Hawaii, it has basically been flatlined. When you adjust for inflation, it's pretty much a flatline cost of moving commodities from US mainland to here in Hawaii. And some people say they're gonna leave the country and move to Hawaii. Well, guess what? We're <laughs> the 50th state. Uh, we saw this play out at the end of, I was in Puerto Rico when Hurricane Maria devastated the Commonwealth of Puerto Rico. And the governor immediately said, we need to repeal the Jones Act to make the cost of commodities go down. We have a very well-established line of communication in our sea routes, mostly between Jacksonville, Florida, and Puerto Rico. It gets there just in time. Ironically, the U.S. Virgin Islands has a Jones Act exemption. So commodities in the U.S. Virgin Islands are significantly more, nearly 20% more than that of Puerto Rico. So the whole economic advantage tends to fall on deaf ears. But at the end of the day, this is all about our security as a seafaring nation. Or are we going to hire out and let others do our bidding? And, and that would be very short-sighted, as I said earlier. Thank you, John. Uh, you're very welcome, uh, Admiral. Uh, and um, Congressman, 
the question here is uh, if why is there so little attention given to China's efforts to dominate global shipping? Uh, given that it's such a concern, uh, why aren't uh, nations, our nation and uh, European nations, uh, so on, saying, hey, listen, uh, you're not playing by the rules. Uh, uh, why aren't, uh, and uh, therefore uh, provide sanctions uh, on the way, on their bad behavior? It's a casualty of the nature of the news media today. Uh, I was, you know, my career after college began as a reporter. I was a journalism major in college. Uh, the the media has this sensationalistic aspect, and uh, especially with uh, cutbacks in traditional media, their their foreign bureaus have closed, and uh, so they they pay attention to inexpensive politics, talking heads. That's about the cheapest thing that you can put on TV as opposed to actually having to go out and gather information and uh, do research and, and so forth. There's also a disposition in mainstream media toward believing that globalism is good. Now, absolutely, there's many beneficial things about globalism. When you can uh, take uh, modern medicine, for example, to uh, some of the areas of uh, sub-Saharan Africa, uh, there's many illustrations of good aspects of globalism. but you have to, to recognize that there are also forces trying to corner the market. If you remember the one slide that I showed, uh, put together by this Australian think tank, that showed the size of China's Belt and Road Initiative today in you know the same measure of dollars, is 100 times bigger than the Marshall Plan, which rebuilt the entirety of Europe. Uh, they are out to control global trade and all of the money that they've made off of uh, doing business with the U.S. and so forth is being applied in that way. So, uh, again, it has to do with an understanding of the economics, of national security, and it's just not sexy enough or controversial enough for the media. But I think if, if people paid attention to the presentation, you can see there's plenty of controversy that can be stirred up here with dependency on China for so many goods and dependency on China for the ability to deliver the goods. Uh, thank you, Congressman. Now I'll uh, uh, attempt to uh, paraphrase some of the questions that we've gotten from uh, from the audience. Uh, a couple of them have to deal with, uh, with shipbuilding. Um, one being is uh, we can buy the, the uh, the air, uh, aircraft industry, uh, the passenger and cargo aircraft industry, they can uh, take advantage of uh, buying foreign air, built aircraft, uh, but uh, we have the prohibition on uh, foreign built ships to, to be in our domestic uh, uh, trades. So, uh, so they ask, well, why is it important to, to maintain the U.S. shipbuilding aspect uh, of the Jones Act? So, um, Tim, you did a little bit of work on your study. You want to, uh, to emphasize again why we uh, need to have that U.S. build uh, requirement? Sure. No, that, that's an excellent question that, that comes up, and it's a pretty uh, logical one when it comes up. Uh, but there are, I think, some solid reasons why having a U.S. build requirement, uh, in addition to some of our other cabotage protections, uh, makes sense. Um, the, the fact that we have this U.S. build requirement enables us to maintain a, sort of an economic industry infrastructure upon which we can draw sort of commercial benefits for the fishing, energy, resource extraction, other commercial transportation activities and the like, but also for national security. Um, and as part of our studies, we found that it's absolutely vital to be able to field the national security fleet that we need. And if we didn't have them, uh, it would go away. Um, that's actually becoming increasingly important. So we recently finished up our contributions to the future naval force structure study. And as part of that project, we found that the Navy is not only going to have to pursue um, the, uh, the procurement of some of the larger combatants that is traditionally procured, but also a growing number of large and small combatants and auxiliaries and support ships of various kinds that are going to need to come from some of these smaller yards or yards that do a mix of government and commercial work. And so by having the U.S. build requirement, it ensures that we have those yards, that we have those suppliers, and we have that capability moving forward. 
Uh, the point's also raised of, well, why can't the U.S. adopt the approach that some other countries in the world has taken? And I think it's eight countries in the world that have that, that build requirement. There's a much larger number, though, that have some indirects or direct subsidies that or regulations that in effect are a build requirement, but eight that have a formal build requirement. And, and I think it comes to sort of a unique nature of the United States. Um, do we want the U.S. maritime industry and national fleet to be like the national fleet of sort of another small or middle tier power? Or do we feel that as a nation, uh, we want to have a first class maritime power that can support us in commerce, but if necessary in conflict? And I think growing international trends suggest that we really do need to have that capacity resident here in the U.S. But thank you for raising that question. <laughs> I'd like to address the aviation aspects, too. There's really two aspects of it. One has to do with the construction of uh, airliners, let's say, and the other is the operation of the routes. Now, the operation of the routes, just like in the Jones Act, Foreign, foreign uh, airlines cannot fly routes between domestic cities. They can fly from uh, London to New York City, but they cannot fly between New York City and Chicago or New York City and Los Angeles or any other two endpoints that are within the United States. Foreign airlines are not allowed by U.S. law to do that. There is a very definite parallel with the Jones Act there. Second, in this area of subsidies, Yes, there's been ongoing controversies, especially involving Airbus, with the massive subsidies that uh, European nations have put into that. In fact, there was a 13-year conflict between the U.S. Uh, and uh, foreign nations with Airbus before the World Trade Organization. It took them 13 years to resolve the dispute and agree that there were improper foreign subsidies going into Airbus and the World Trade Organization a few months ago, authorized the United States to issue billions of dollars of retaliatory tariffs against European nations because of the heavy subsidies they had had in aviation. So they've been doing that in aviation. They're doing that even bigger uh, in shipping. When you look at uh, uh, China in particular, also it's uh, important in South Korea and Japan, but mostly uh, in China with the massive subsidies. So it's the routes and it's the construction where you bring in these parallels with aviation and the Jones Act. Uh, thank you. Um, this is a, an interesting question that says, okay, if China's the problem, why don't we just ban China Chinese ships from engaging in our trades and allow everybody else? Uh, and uh, so that we could, you know, our, with our NATO allies and, and so on. So, you know, uh, as, as, as an option. Yeah, that, those, would be, those would be major steps. And uh, uh, frankly, if we tried to uh, block Chinese vessels from bringing goods into the U.S., uh, it, would, it would have a lot of uh, dominoes that fall because of that. Uh, I can only imagine how much disruption that would be in all the capitals of the world. Well, certainly I, I was looking at some statistics but, yesterday. But Trump has put in a lot of tariffs on Chinese goods, as opposed to banning them from landing at U.S. ports. Well, the, the amount of shipping that they have, uh, as well as what they've done in their subsidizing and shipbuilding, I mean, uh, I was looking at uh, OECD statistics. They have uh, 30 times as many ships under their flag or Hong Kong flag uh, uh, than we do. So it just gives an indication of how they could control the trade if, we, uh, if it was opened up. Uh, a question that was asked is, uh, what is the uh, uh, Biden's administration's perspective on the Jones Act? Hmm. Uh, I, I, can, I have heard that they are supportive of it, but I have not seen anything officially from them. There was a, a uh, campaign statement that they came out strongly on, on behalf of the Jones Act. So uh, I think that is an area where uh, we won't see any change, at least uh, under the next administration, um, uh, at least uh, fr uh, from today. Uh, John, if I could, just to build on that, sort of, I, I think it, there's an opportunity to, to slightly uh, turn that, that question a bit. And um, 
I think it's uh, the Biden administration will have an opportunity not just to, I think, affirm the Jones Act, but also to pursue new initiatives to strengthen the maritime industry. Uh, I think a comprehensive approach is necessary to the international fleet, to the U.S. government fleets, uh, but then the domestic fleet. I know we're focused today on the domestic fleet, so I think there are a number of initiatives a new Biden administration could pursue. Uh, the administration's expressed or the, as the campaign, they've expressed interest in new infrastructure, in new green initiatives, and the maritime industry is actually a pretty good confluence of the two, where we're talking about building maritime infrastructure, building uh, low carbon uh, emitting uh, transportation mechanisms, uh, green industries that support sort of our economy uh, in the oceans as we build a blue economy, and then also support uh, sort of re reduced emissions. So there are many opportunities to do that. Uh, the maritime industry is sometimes viewed as sort of like an old-fashioned industry compared to um, pharmaceuticals or material sciences, quantum, what have you. Uh, but the reality is that I think that it's on the cusp for some major growth, be it in autonomous shipping, uh, highly integrated intermodal links, um, space-enabled navigation and tracking. And, and so the administration will have an actual opportunity to, I think, lead, um, be it through uh, fully funding the Title XI uh, programs, um, enhancing the national shipbuilding research programs and others. And historically, sort of the US maritime industry has been a leader in technology. We look at schooners in the 19th century, we look at um, containerization and LNG carriers in the 20th century and a number of other technologies. We've been pretty good at leading. Uh, now in the 21st century, I think the Biden administration, um, as it appears it's gonna be, will have an opportunity, I think, to, to take some leadership and as Admiral Zukunf said, actually craft a integrated national strategy um, for the maritime industry and then implement it. Uh, and this could provide an approach for, for funding some of those and building a more vibrant industry moving forward. Well, thanks, Tim. This will be the, the last question. Uh, and it's one that we hear all the time. Um, and it says that basically uh, the, the, there's been a lot of, um, of, of press that the uh, the Jones Act is the reason why we don't have a strong maritime industry and shipbuilding industrial base, and that if we repealed it, um, that it would become more robust. Um, I think uh, all of you have alluded to that it's an unfair playing field. That's certainly what the report to Congress has said, but does um, anybody want to add to to why uh, that's not necessarily going to uh, change things around if we uh, and make the shipbuilding industry more robust or generate uh, hundreds of U.S. flagships in international trade? I, I think you have a general challenge with the level of regulations that uh, are placed upon the American economy that are not placed on foreign competitors. Uh, you find that we do a lot of that to ourselves. Now, this is not just about shipbuilding. It's about uh, heavy industry in general. Uh, regulatory reform and getting rid of the needless red tape would certainly help. However, the big challenge is the fact that other countries are funneling billions of dollars into their uh, shipbuilding and logistics and port buying uh, and uh, control mechanisms. Uh, doing away with the Jones Act does not abolish those subsidies, which are the source of the major advantages. Just like we had, uh, and it took 13 years for the World Trade Organization to agree that there were billions of dollars of illegal subsidies going to Airbus. Uh, the President of the United States has been granted authority by the Congress to issue retaliatory tariffs, if you will, which is what the Trump administration has done in a lot of things with China. It's caused controversy, but uh, doing things that get at the root of the problem, which is the heavy mega subsidies of other countries for their maritime, that's the real challenge. Thank you, uh, Congressman. I, I, I know that uh, the European, uh, our European allies have uh, shown extreme concern about what's been happening to their shipbuilding industry uh, through uh, their competition with, with China. Many of their shipyards have been put out of business. Their merchant marines have also shrunk. So um, saying that to depend on our allies and their strong maritime uh, industries uh, is probably the, not the, the, the right solution. Most of that has gone to Asia, and the Asian countries are the ones that are the most subject 
to a potential ch a future Chinese pressure and therefore potentially could cause us uh, to be shut out of, of the markets. So uh, I think this brings us to, uh, to the end of our presentation. I will now turn it over uh, to uh, Mike for some uh, closing remarks. Thank you. Yes, thank you, John. Wow, what a uh, what a tremendous panel. What a great subject. And uh, you know, thank you, John, and to all of our distinguished speakers for their insights today. Uh, for all of our viewers, uh, we hope you can join us on November 19th for a special topic breakfast uh, webinar featuring Major General Tracy King, the Director of Expeditionary Warfare for the United States Marine Corps. Again, thank you everyone for joining us. I hope you have a great evening and looking forward to seeing you next time.